This is a LibriVox recording. Candide by Voltaire. Chapter 4. How Candide found his old master Pangloss, and what happened to them. Candide, yet more moved with compassion than with horror, gave to this shocking beggar the two florins which he had received from the honest Anabaptist James. The spectre looked at him very earnestly, dropped a few tears, and fell upon his neck. Candide recoiled in disgust. Alas, said one wretch to the other, do you no longer know your dear Pangloss? What do I hear? You, my dear master, you in this terrible plight? What misfortune has happened to you? Why are you no longer in the most magnificent of castles? What has become of Miss Cunegonde, the pearl of girls and nature's masterpiece? I am so weak that I cannot stand, said Pangloss, upon which Candide carried him to the Anabaptist's stable, and gave him a crust of bread. As soon as Pangloss had refreshed himself a little, Well, said Candide, Cunegonde? She is dead, replied the other. Candide fainted at this word. His friend recalled his senses with a little bad vinegar, which he found by chance in the stable. Candide reopened his eyes. Cunegonde is dead. Oh, best of worlds, where art thou? But of what illness did she die? Was it not for grief upon seeing her father kick me out of his magnificent castle? No, said Pangloss. She was ripped open by the Bulgarian soldiers. After having been violated by many, they broke the baron's head for attempting to defend her. My lady, her mother, was cut in pieces. My poor pupil was served just in the same manner as his sister. But as for the castle, they have not left one stone upon another, not a barn, not a sheep, nor a duck, nor a tree. But we have had our revenge, for the Abares have done the very same thing to a neighboring barony which belonged to a Bulgarian lord. At this discourse Candide fainted again, but coming to himself, and having said all that it became him to say, inquired into the cause and effect, as well as into the sufficient reason that had reduced Pangloss to so miserable a plight. Alas, said the other, it was love. Love, the comfort of the human species, the preserver of the universe, the soul of all sensible things. Love, tender love. Alas, said Candide, I know this love, that sovereign of hearts, that soul of our souls, yet it never cost me more than a kiss and twenty kicks on the backside. How could this beautiful cause produce in you an effect so abominable? Pangloss made answer in these terms. Oh, my dear Candide, you remember Paquette, that pretty wench who waited on our noble baroness? In her arms I tasted the delights of paradise, which produced in me those hell torments with which you see me devoured. She was infected with them. She is perhaps dead of them. This present Paquette received of a learned grey friar, who had traced it to its source. He had had it of an old countess, who had received it from a cavalry captain who owed it to a marchioness, who took it from a page, who had received it from a Jesuit, who, when a novice, had it in a direct line from one of the companions of Christopher Columbus. For my part, I shall give it to nobody. I am dying. Oh, Pangloss, cried Candide, what a strange genealogy! Is not the devil the original stock of it? Not at all, replied this great man. It was a thing unavoidable, a necessary ingredient in the best of worlds. For if Columbus had not, in an island of America, caught this disease, which contaminates the source of life, frequently even hinders generation, and which is evidently opposed to the great end of nature, we should have neither chocolate nor cochineal. We are to observe that upon our continent, this distemper is like religious controversy, 
confined to a particular spot the turks the indians the persians the chinese the siamese the japanese know nothing of it but there is a sufficient reason for believing that they will know it in their turn in a few centuries in the meantime it has made marvellous progress among us especially in those great armies composed of honest well-disciplined hirelings who decide the destiny of states for we may safely affirm that when an army of thirty thousand men fights another of an equal number there are about twenty thousand of them poxed on each side well this is wonderful said candide but you must get cured alas how can i said pangloss i have not a farthing my friend and all over the globe there is no letting of blood or taking a glister without paying or somebody paying for you these last words determined candide he went and flung himself at the feet of the charitable Anabaptist James, and gave him so touching a picture of the state to which his friend was reduced, that the good man did not scruple to take Dr. Pangloss into his house, and had him cured at his expense. In the cure Pangloss lost only an eye and an ear. He wrote well, and knew arithmetic perfectly. The Anabaptist James made him his bookkeeper at the end of two months being obliged to go to lisbon about some mercantile affairs he took the two philosophers with him in his ship pangloss explained to him how everything was so constituted that it could not be better james was not of this opinion it is more likely said he mankind have a little corrupted nature for they were not born wolves and they have become wolves god has given them neither cannon of four-and-twenty pounders nor bayonets and yet they have made cannon and bayonets to destroy one another into this account i might throw not only bankrupts but justice which seizes on the effects of bankrupts to cheat the creditors all this was indispensable replied the one-eyed doctor for private misfortunes make the general good so that the more private misfortunes there are the greater is the general good while he reasoned the sky darkened the winds blew from the four quarters and the ship was assailed by a most terrible tempest within sight of the port of lisbon End chapter four this is a li this is a librivox recording candide by voltaire chapter five tempest shipwreck earthquake and what became of dr pangloss candide and james the anabaptist half dead of that inconceivable anguish which the rolling of a ship produces one half of the passengers were not even sensible of the danger the other half shrieked and prayed the sheets were rent the masts broken the vessel gaped work who would no one heard no one commanded the anabaptist being upon deck bore a hand when a brutish sailor struck him roughly and laid him sprawling but with the violence of the blow he himself tumbled head foremost overboard and stuck upon a piece of the broken mast honest james ran to his assistance hauled him up and from the effort he made was precipitated into the sea in sight of the sailor who left him to perish without deigning to look at him candide drew near and saw his benefactor who rose above the water one moment and was then swallowed up for ever he was just going to jump after him but was prevented by the philosopher pangloss who demonstrated to him that the bay of lisbon had been made on purpose for the anabaptist to be drowned while he was proving this a priori the ship foundered all perished except pangloss candide and that brutal sailor who had drowned the good anabaptist the villain swam safely to the shore while pangloss and candide were borne thither upon a plank as soon as they recovered themselves a little they walked towards lisbon they had some money left with which they hoped to save themselves from starving after they had escaped drowning scarcely had they reached the city lamenting the death of their benefactor 
when they felt the earth tremble under their feet. The sea swelled and foamed in the harbor, and beat to pieces the vessels riding at anchor. Whirlwinds of fire and ashes covered the streets and public places. Houses fell, roofs were flung upon the pavements, and the pavements were scattered. Thirty thousand inhabitants of all ages and sexes were crushed under the ruins. The sailor, whistling and swearing, said there was booty to be gained here. "'What can be the sufficient reason of this phenomenon?' said Pangloss. "'This is the last day!' cried Candide. The sailor ran among the ruins, facing death to find money. Finding it, he took it, got drunk, and having slept himself sober, purchased the favors of the first good-natured wench whom he met on the ruins of the destroyed houses. And in the midst of the dying and the dead, Pangloss pulled him by the sleeve. "'My friend,' he said, "'this is not right.' you sin against the universal reason you choose your time badly splod and fury answered the other i am a sailor and born in batavia four times have i trampled upon the crucifix in four voyages to japan a fig for thy universal reason some falling stones had wounded candide he lay stretched in the street covered with rubbish alas he said to pangloss Get me a little wine and oil. I am dying. This concussion of the earth is no new thing, answered Pangloss. The city of Lima in America experienced the same convulsions last year, the same cause, the same effects. There is certainly a train of sulphur underground from Lima to Lisbon. Nothing more probable, said Candide. But for the love of God, a little oil and wine? how probable replied the philosopher i maintain that the point is capable of being demonstrated candide fainted away and pangloss fetched him some water from a neighbouring fountain the following day they rummaged among the ruins and found provisions with which they repaired their exhausted strength after this they joined with others in relieving those inhabitants who had escaped death some whom they had succored gave them as good a dinner as they could in such disastrous circumstances true the repast was mournful and the company moistened their bread with tears but pangloss consoled them assuring them that things could not be otherwise for he said all that is is for the best if there is a volcano at lisbon it cannot be elsewhere it is impossible that things should be other than they are, for everything is right. A little man dressed in black, familiar of the Inquisition, who sat by him, politely took up his word and said, Apparently, then, sir, you do not believe in original sin, for if all is for the best, there has been neither fall nor punishment. "'I humbly ask your excellency's pardon,' answered Pangloss, still more politely, "'for the fall and curse of man necessarily entered into the system of the best of worlds.' "'Sir,' said the familiar, "'you do not then believe in liberty?' "'Your excellency will excuse me,' said Pangloss. "'Liberty is consistent with absolute necessity, for it was necessary we should be free.' For, in short, the determinate will— Pangloss was in the middle of his sentence, when the familiar beckoned to his footman, who gave him a glass of wine from Porto or Oporto. End chapter 5 This is a LibriVox li recording. Candide by Voltaire Chapter 6 How the Portuguese made a beautiful auto da fe to prevent any further earthquakes, and how Candide was publicly whipped. After the earthquake had destroyed three-fourths of Lisbon, the sages of that country could think of no means more effectual to prevent utter ruin than to give the people a beautiful auto da fe, for it had been decided by the University of Coimbra that the burning of a few people alive by a slow fire, and with great ceremony, is an infallible secret to hinder the earth from quaking. 
in consequence hereof they had seized on a biscainer convicted of having married his godmother and on two portuguese for rejecting the bacon which larded a chicken they were eating after dinner they came and secured dr pangloss and his disciple candide the one for speaking his mind the other for having listened with an air of approbation they were conducted to separate apartments extremely cold as they were never incommoded by the sun eight days after they were dressed in san benitos and their heads ornamented with paper mitres the mitre and san benito belonging to candide were painted with reversed flames and with devils that had neither tails nor claws but pangloss's devils had claws and tails and the flames were upright they marched in procession thus habited and heard a very pathetic sermon followed by fine church music candide was whipped in cadence while they were singing the biscainer and the two men who had refused to eat bacon were burnt and pangloss was hanged though that was not the custom the same day the earth sustained a most violent concussion candide terrified amazed desperate all bloody all palpitating said to himself if this is the best of possible worlds what then are the others well if i had been only whipped i could put up with it for i experienced that among the bulgarians but oh my dear pangloss thou greatest of philosophers that i should have seen you hanged without knowing for what o oh, my dear anabaptist thou best of men that thou shouldst have been drowned in the very harbour o oh, miss cunegonde thou pearl of girls that thou shouldst have had thy belly ripped open thus he was musing scarce able to stand preached at whipped absolved and blessed when an old woman accosted him saying my son take courage and follow me end chapter six this is a librivox recording candide by voltaire chapter seven how the old woman took care of candide and how he found the object he loved candide did not take courage but followed the old woman to a decayed house where she gave him a pot of pomatum to anoint his sores showed him a very neat little bed with a suit of clothes hanging up and left him something to eat and drink eat drink sleep said she and may our lady of atocha the great saint antony of padua and the great saint james of compostela received you under their protection i shall be back to-morrow candide amazed at all he had suffered and still more with the charity of the old woman wished to kiss her hand it is not my hand you must kiss said the old woman i shall be back to-morrow anoint yourself with the pomatum eat and sleep candide notwithstanding so many disasters ate and slept the next morning the old woman brought him his breakfast looked at his back and rubbed it herself with another ointment in like manner she brought him his dinner and at night she returned with his supper the day following she went through the very same ceremonies who are you said candide who has inspired you with so much goodness what return can i make you the good woman made no answer she returned in the evening but brought no supper come with me she said and say nothing she took him by the arm and walked with him about a quarter of a mile into the country they arrived at a lonely house surrounded with gardens and canals the old woman knocked at a little door it opened she led candide up a private staircase into a small apartment richly furnished she left him on a brocaded sofa shut the door and went away candide thought himself in a dream indeed that he had been dreaming unluckily all his life and that the present moment was the only agreeable part of it all the old woman returned very soon supporting with difficulty a trembling woman of a majestic figure brilliant with jewels and covered with a veil take off that veil said the old woman to candide 
the young man approaches he raises the veil with a timid hand oh what a moment what surprise he believes he beholds miss cunegonde he really sees her it is herself his strength fails him he cannot utter a word but drops at her feet cunegonde falls upon the sofa the old woman supplies a smelling bottle they come to themselves and recover their speech as they began with broken accents with questions and answers interchangeably interrupted with sighs with tears and cries the old woman desired they would make less noise and then she left them to themselves what is it you said candide you live i find you again in portugal then you have not been ravished then they did not rip open your belly as dr pangloss informed me yes they did said the beautiful cunegonde but those two accidents are not always mortal but were your father and mother killed it is but true answered cunegonde in tears and your brother my brother was also killed and why are you in portugal and how did you know of my being here and by what strange adventure did you contrive to bring me to this house i will tell you all that replied the lady but first of all let me know your history since the innocent kiss you gave me and the kicks which you received candide respectfully obeyed her and though he was still in a surprise though his voice was feeble and trembling though his back still pained him yet he gave her a most ingenuous account of everything that had befallen him since the moment of their separation cunegonde lifted up her eyes to heaven shed tears upon hearing of the death of the good anabaptist and of pangloss after which she spoke as follows to candide who did not lose a word and devoured her with his eyes End. This chapter is a seven. LibriVox recording. Candide by Voltaire. Chapter eight. The history of Cunegonde. I was in bed fast asleep when it pleased God to send the Bulgarians to our delightful castle of Thunderton Trunk. They slew my father and brother and cut my mother in pieces. A tall Bulgarian, six feet high, perceiving that I had fainted away at this sight, began to ravish me this made me recover i regained my senses i cried i struggled i bit i scratched i wanted to tear out the tall bulgarian's eyes not knowing that what happened at my father's house was the usual practice of war the brute gave me a cut in the left side with his hanger and the mark is still upon me ah i hope i shall see it said honest candide you shall said cunegonde but let us continue do so replied candide thus she resumed the thread of her story a bulgarian captain came in saw me all bleeding and the soldier not in the least disconcerted the captain flew into a passion at the disrespectful behaviour of the brute and slew him on my body he ordered my wounds to be dressed and took me to his quarters as a prisoner of war i washed the few shirts that he had i did his cooking he thought me very pretty he avowed it on the other hand i must own he had a good shape and a soft and white skin but he had little or no mind or philosophy and you might see plainly that he had never been instructed by dr pangloss in three months time having lost all his money and being grown tired of my company he sold me to a jew named don issachar who traded to holland and portugal and had a strong passion for women this jew was much attached to my person but could not triumph over it i resisted him better than the bulgarian soldier a modest woman may be ravished once but her virtue is strengthened by it in order to render me more tractable he brought me to his country house hitherto i had imagined that nothing could equal the beauty of thunder tintronk castle but i found i was mistaken the grand inquisitor seeing me one day at mass stared long at me and sent to tell me that he wished to speak on private matters i was conducted to his palace where i acquainted him with the history of my family and he represented to me how much it was beneath my rank to belong to an israelite a proposal was then made to don issachar that he should resign me to my lord don issachar being the court banker and a man of credit would hear nothing of it 
the inquisitor threatened him with an auto de fe at last my jew intimidated concluded a bargain by which the house and myself should belong to both in common the jew should have for himself monday wednesday and saturday and the inquisitor should have the rest of the week ah, it is now six months since this agreement was made quarrels have not been wanting for they could not decide whether the night from saturday to sunday belonged to the old law or to the new for my part i have so far held out against both and i verily believe that this is the reason why i am still beloved at length to avert the scourge of earthquakes and to intimidate don issachar my lord inquisitor was pleased to celebrate an auto da fe he did me the honour to invite me to the ceremony i had a very good seat and the ladies were served with refreshments between mass and the execution i was in truth seized with horror at the burning of those two jews and of the honest biscainer who had married his godmother but what was my surprise my fright my trouble when i saw in a san benito and mitre a figure which resembled that of pangloss i, I rubbed my eyes i looked at him attentively i saw him hung i fainted scarcely had i recovered my senses than i saw you stripped stark naked and this was the height of my horror consternation grief and despair i tell you truthfully that your skin is yet whiter and of a more perfect colour than that of my bulgarian captain this spectacle redoubled all the feelings which overwhelmed and devoured me i screamed out and would have said stop barbarians but my voice failed me and my cries would have been useless after you had been severely whipped how is it possible said i that the beloved candide and the wise pangloss should both be at lisbon the one to receive a hundred lashes and the other to be hanged by the grand inquisitor of whom i am the well-beloved pangloss most cruelly deceived me when he said that everything in the world is for the best agitated lost sometimes beside myself and sometimes ready to die of weakness my mind was filled with the massacre of my father mother and brother with the insolence of the ugly bulgarian soldier with the stab that he gave me with my servitude under the bulgarian captain with my hideous don issachar with my abominable inquisitor with the execution of dr pangloss with the grand miserere to which they whipped you and especially with the kiss i gave you behind the screen the day that i had last seen you i praised god for bringing you back to me after so many trials and i charged my old woman to take care of you and to conduct you hither as soon as possible she has executed her commission perfectly well i have tasted the inexpressible pleasure of seeing you again of hearing you of speaking with you oh, but you must be hungry for myself i am famished let us have supper they both sat down to table and when supper was over they placed themselves once more on the sofa where they were when signor don issachar arrived it was the jewish sabbath and issachar had come to enjoy his rights and to explain his tender love. End chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Candide by Voltaire, read by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during January 2007.